Hello everyone, it's Jason. I decided to do the second part of the trip to Don Scott Antique Show. So this is video two, as I promised you. First and foremost, I would still like to send a very heartfelt shout out to Tanya at My Jewelry Addiction. She's on later this evening, which is Sunday night. And I will be there in the live chat, so if you wish to visit, just know that I'll be there. She starts at 7 o'clock in Ohio time, and I think that's um, 4 o'clock California time, I'm thinking. <laughs> Anyways, also, I wanted to give a little shout out to D at The Thrill of the Thrift. Her channel is fantastic, and she was so warm and inviting in the chat, and her people in the chat were just magnificent. Enough of that. I'm going to start right into this. So this cuff that you're taking a look at, this was in my last video from Don Scott, and I told you that I would bring it back. And here it is in all of its glory. Sterling silver and mixed gemstones. So we have in the top here a basically an Indian village and constructed out of all stone. And it's all tension set and remarkably well done. The detail of the little windows and the doors and the rooftops, just extraordinary craftsmanship. Um, a, a An absolute beauty, and I told you that I would bring it back, so here it is. Again, I don't clean my silver, so the oxidation and the patination is going to stay there. I would never clean this. And then when you turn it, um, to look on the inside, look at the detail on the inside. The stone inlay is absolutely remarkable. It is artisan signed along this edge right there, RRG. And then the shell inlay and the stone inlay, again, is some of the most beautiful I have ever seen. So that was inspired, I'm sure, by Charles Laloma, who was an Hopi artist who I talked about before, and um, just inspired by him. And it does sit up as a sculpture when it's not on the body. So it does sit up like that, and it's so comfortable and so beautiful, and I told you that I would bring it back. So there's that. On to a few of the things that I showed in the last video that unfortunately I couldn't get in close enough on. So many people commented on this tiny little bird. It is sterling silver. It is hallmarked right there with the word silver. And then it is so carefully constructed and then hand done cloisonné enamel. Inset in the wings are carnelian and inset in the eyes are car carnelian and so beautifully crafted, sits up like a real bird. Um, just a remarkable piece. So elegant, so beautiful. And again, it was only $4 at the Don Scott Antique Show, and I immediately scooped it up. It was one of those um, immediate things. Most of these are made out of brass, and I don't want to say not as important, but, you know, um, shall you say commercial trade uh, when people go to China and want to bring something home. This one is just um, upscaled from that and um, definitely slightly more, um, shall you say, important. And you know what? I think I made a mistake. I did. I made a mistake. Those eyes are not carnelian. They're actually enamel. So I take that back. Uh, but I do like to correct myself when I'm wrong, because <laughs> if you don't, it's like I said before, totally unattractive. So we have enameled eyes, not carnelian, and then we have carnelian inset in the bezels in the wings. So there you go. Sorry about the mistake. <laughs> um, we all make them, right? On to um, things that I wear. Um, the things that I wore to Don Scott, someone had asked me. So I wore this platinum and diamond brooch. It is Edwardian. And it's uh, diamond lace. So essentially, all the diamonds are inset in platinum. Uh, when you turn it over, there's the classic mechanism for that time period. And then um, the azuring on the back of the brooch is almost as beautiful as the front. So when you're looking at diamonds and platinum, look for the quality of the craftsmanship, not only in the metal, but also the quality of the stones. And highly unusual to have a marquee, or let's call it a navette, 
um, diamond in the center, very unusual for that time period because marquee really didn't gain traction until the 1920s, 1930s. Well, let's be honest about that as well. So a little bit ahead of its time, but the diamonds are um, just magnificent and the brooch is of supreme quality. Then a, another brooch that I wore right under it, of course, because I love to have fun. I always have a piece of Bakelite on and this is my dog in the doghouse brooch. This is the one that I wear. I have the same brooch but it's in much better condition and I don't wear it. And the other one I bought from Sally Loeb. This one, it has a celluloid backing. So this is celluloid on the back, riveted through to hold the Bakelite dog in place, little glass inset eye, brass collar, bl brass leash, but just a beautiful and handsome fellow who's minding his own business in his house. And I have always loved wearing this brooch. And every time I do, so many compliments and, and so, much, um, so much love given to that. And I can see why. Another piece that I wore um, when I went down to the show, this was one of, is one of my current favorites. You might be saying that this is um, Blue Topaz. It's not. It's Aquamarine. And it's set in white, gold, and platinum. It has four diamonds in the bale. And then uh, the bale has the enhancer, so you can open this up. I have closed it off completely just because I didn't want this to come undone. Be careful with your enhancers because they have a tendency to come open. So just be careful. It's on a white gold chain. I'm not a fan of the rope chain for this, but it will um, do for now. And then this Portuguese cut, incredible, incredible, lush, beautiful, genuine aquamarine. This I bought at the Burton Antique show just a few years ago from my friend Marsha. She comes over, I believe she's located uh, just outside of New York now. At least I, I, that's the last time I had talked with her. That's where she was living. Um, and maybe she moved to Pennsylvania. But regardless, just an incredible, incredible stone that seems to go on forever. Um, it's it, just incredible. I, I um, was truly astounded by this. And it's just at 70 carats. So I, I believe it was um, as we um, mic'd the stone or took the millimeter gauge and did the um, uh, um, the additive um, process online with um, putting in the measurements, the carat weight came back at, I believe it was just over 70 carats. Um, but I mean, even if it was 20 carats, I would still be delighted because that is magic. And again, um, you can kind of see this kaleidoscope effect uh, and the faceting is truly uh, world class. So just an absolute gorgeous aquamarine that um, I love so, so much. And then on to the last piece that I wore at Don Scott um, is this. And I made the chain. And this was a collaboration um, between me and an artist in Cleveland. His name is Mike Jazak. Um, Mike didn't ever do commission work, and I was kind of a thorn in his side for over a year before he agreed to do this with me. Um, he kept saying, "No, no, I don't. You know, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't do commissions." And uh, I stayed on him for a very long time, and he agreed to do this. One of the most beautiful cloisonne enamels, little eighteen karat gold stars in the sky, an angel and embracing a nude figure. Um, but, you know, you can't really tell who has the wings in this picture. It looks as though the wings are on both of them. Um, and uh, the storyline there is um, fantastic. It was done after and inspired by um, a pendant by um, Phoebe uh, Tranquois. And uh, he dated it, and he signed it, and it said After Sanctuary by uh, Trinquois, who was a female metalsmith at the turn of the century, um, 1900, turn of the century. Um, I did the silver work. So Mike did the enameling, and then I did the sterling silver frame. And again, it's slightly domed, so it was very difficult to create this frame and not chip the enamel. And then he made little, shall you say, um, synthetic opal stones um, out of enamel and glass. And then I bezel set them and then um, put the jump rings together and soldered, soldered all of this together. And then on the back, um, to not put tension on the enamel, I um, um, folded over these um, kind of half bezels to then hold the enamel in place on the back. 
Um, I don't know why my hands are always so greasy. It's like I just ate chips before I went on here. Um, but uh, then there's this chain. There's bars and jump rings. Again, completely hand constructed by me, soldered together. And there's one of my usual clasps that I did. Kind of a shepherd's hook clasp. Old style. Um, well made. And then um, hammered down to create a spring uh, silver kind of uh, tension on that. Otherwise, it wouldn't stay shut. So just one of the things that I wore at Don Scott, that's kind of uh, was my choice for my daily armor <laughs> that day. Um, and then let's see, there was one other thing. Oh, um, the paperweight. Someone asked to see this close up of the fish. This is the paperweight with the fish and in, in trapped air on the inside of the paperweight. Completely art glass, very large, very beautifully done. And um, it just, you know, it was one of those things that I saw and I immediately had to snap it up. We're 10 minutes in and I promised that this would be about jewelry, so we'll get there. And uh, we'll start with this. This was an artist-made construct construction. Sterling silver, artisan-made clasp, marked there, sterling, 925. And then completely hand-fabricated with these sterling bars that are drilled. And then spring steel wire, or shall I say, um, you know, the uh, steel wire, the steel cable that um, then is um, holding the beads in place and um, a beautiful clasping mechanism very simple but very direct and um, a lovely piece and that was only I think that was $20 and again if I can't make something for that certain amount of money I most certainly will buy it um, and as long as it's well made it comes home in the same mindset um, there was this necklace, and um, this was in a showcase with a ton of other stuff, just kind of all tangled up. Anything in the case was $20. So again, did I feel it was extremely important? The answer is no. Did I feel it was fashionable, fun, and something that I could sell? Absolutely. So you have amethyst, and then you have these, um, they appear to be um, hematite, you know, um, fool's gold or um, a, a, of that um, stone. It's not. They're actually sterling silver that are hollow formed and then created as a bead. So those are actually sterling that space these other gemstones. I'm fairly certain that this one is um, treated, definitely dyed, at least in my mind it is. And then you have citrine, of course. So it's just a, um, a beautiful necklace and beautiful. And maybe these are color treated. Maybe they were quartz and then dyed to look like amethyst. I'll look at that closer in a little while. I don't want to ever give false information to my viewers. Um, I'm here to educate and have some fun, but beautiful, well done, and fashionable. Then I have this greater tendency to steer away from costume lately, and I, I don't know what my problem is with that, but, um, you know, I look for specifics, and this was a beautiful large pin flower, and it was $12. Um, she took 10 for it, and you know how I am about uranium glass. It's not that I don't care about it, but it's just glass, and so you don't need to freak out, but um, let's see if I can get my black light on here. So let me turn the light out in the booth. Give me one second, and I'll go with, um, see, that's uranium, and then all the yellow ones are uranium, which was so strange to me, because being yellow, I didn't think that they would glow, and they most certainly do. But again, let's all calm down. <laughs> uranium is just glass. Um, it's, it's, um, it's just another glass. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And the brooch would be from the late 50s, early 60s. So um, just uh, beautifully constructed. And again, you know, can you attribute this to somebody? Can you say that it's Juliana or d &E or Weiss? I'm sure you most certainly can. Um, does it matter? Not particularly on this one. Um, so there's that. And um, I just, I knew that someone else would fall in love with it. So that was definitely resale because it just didn't have enough traction to stay with me as a piece that I would love. However, this has enough traction to stay with me because I do love it. This is the amber brooch. Look how large it is. And it is technically egg yolk amber. Um, and you can see the coloration just looking exactly like egg yolk. It has that yellow, but it starts to lean orange. Um, and then the simple mechanism here, this is a low grade silver that is riveted into the amber and then a steel pin stem on the back of it. Simple rollover clasp right there. I mean, a, I shouldn't say rollover, but a C-clasp, um, so simple. And then sterling silver that has been oxidized, and then these beautiful amber, natural amber drops that are so carefully, carefully drilled out at the top, um, amber so fragile, and then a um, an eyelet 
on a wire is inset from the top to hold those in place. I love the the raw edge on this, the natural edge. And um, again, just an, a really beautiful design. Um, I have one similar. I'll bring that one to a video at some point so you can see the similar design, but just remarkable in terms of its size and craft. And I loved it. So on to, let's see, what else? Oh, these silver trays. I didn't put these in and um, they had been kind of floating around and I uh, took the chance because I felt like finish wise and I felt like the way they were hammered, the solder seams where these half round feet were applied read to me as silver and they are. Um, I believe them to be from India uh, the way they're hammered and the way they're finished. Sometimes we see these from Egypt. Um, and again, this one is signed right there. And um, you can tell silver if it's not marked. And I don't want to encourage you to bend things, but there is a little bit of play in this. So you could just barely push on it a little bit and it moves very easily. That's a telltale sign of silver. If it doesn't move very easily, it means that it's probably plated. There's probably brass or copper underneath. Um, so, but these trays were just beautiful. Moderately priced. I believe this one was $30 or $35. And this one, I think, was 25 or 28 and just in silver alone they're at least double that just in silver value so pay attention to things that um, look like they're silver and then um, you know study them very close this bracelet was an exception for me I have a tendency not to fall in love with contemporary jewelry um, or contemporary craft but this one really got me um, it is signed on the inside here so it is Italian 14 karat and then very robust gold. Look at how thick the gold is from the side. So all of the yellow that you're seeing is solid 14 karat. And then it's holding together this steel cable, very unisex, very male, very female. And I felt like something that would sell very quickly because it is that way. Very classy. And um, I think one of the designs that's going to hold on for us, I think something that will always be desirable from here forward. Um, I have an empty bag here, so I don't know what that goes to. Um, I stopped at a pawn shop. Wait, this wasn't from a pawn shop. This was from Don Scott. And so uh, this was 14 karat, labeled as a ruby, $350 with diamond. As soon as I saw this, it was a yes. I didn't even have to think about it. Probably going to have to wipe the stone off. Again, I didn't clean anything, um, but there we go. So again, can we fight over the stone and can we say, or disagree, I should say, not fight. <laughs> um, I don't know why I keep having fighting on my brain, but um, usually I don't. Can you say that this is a pink sapphire? Yes. Can you say that it's a ruby? Technically, yes, because it's in the corundum family. So uh, it is a natural stone. Um, and I did take a look at it just a little bit uh, when I was there, and it is a natural stone. I'll get into natural and synthetic at some point. Very high, high mounting, custom made, you can tell. Absolutely, you can tell. And then channel set diamonds. There are nine diamonds on both sides. Very clean, very beautiful, and 14 karat solid gold. Beautiful thickness. Look how thick the metal is. You can tell that's a sign of quality. Um, that they labored over this mounting and cast and fabricated. So it's cast, and then uh, the head is then fabricated and cast, uh, uh, soldered in place. So cast and fabricated mounting. Beautiful, beautiful presentation. And on the finger, it would just be a, a stunner. So that was, I knew that would be an easy sell. I knew that I could make, you know, quite a bit of money on it. So exciting on that. Um, just a fun sterling ring. Um, had to have it. Needs to be cleaned. Needs to be straightened out a little bit. But sterling, anything artisan and fun uh, that has good attention to detail, excellent craft, and always make sure that your silver is right. See how it's leaning a little bit? So the silversmith in me is going to straighten this back out and then work on these to straighten those out. It was only $10, so that was a moneymaker as well. And then in the same booth, let's see, I'll just bring this whole bag over. In this booth, there was, um, this woman was a delight. She was from Missouri, I believe. I don't know what that tag goes to. I have no idea. <laughs> then there's this ring. This was, uh, I think this was $12, or, or maybe it was $10. Regardless, uh, it was an instantaneous buy. So we do have Peridot. 
Uh, I believe the pink stone is rhodochrosite, but again, I'll settle in with that and I'll know exactly once I really study these pieces. But I promised you the video, so here I am, and I'm so delighted that you're here with me. So thanks again for joining. Sterling silver, beautiful construction, and the bezels are really beautifully executed. So when you're buying things like this, just make sure that you look at the craft. And don't necessarily listen to what a seller promotes it as. You got to be smart and you got to do your research. But really, really, really just a beautiful ring. Um, and I knew that was a moneymaker. Um, and then there is, let's see here. This is all jumbled up. Um, but these were just, um, what is that besides junk in my booth now? <laughs> There's um, a little cat pendant uh, that has a heart around it. The Black Hills gold and sterling silver. This was $5. This was $2. Uh, this I got for $20. It's Peridot and sterling. But again, I buy a lot of things for resale. So I'll pop a chain on this and make kind of a lot of money because the stones are so beautiful and the silver is so well done. This lady was a delight as well. How could I not have loved her? And this was 20 and I think I got it for 15 Dichroic glass and artisan constructed. It, again, if I can't make it for the price they're selling it for, I most certainly will snap something up. And I loved this design. I don't buy things just to buy, but I buy things because of the craft that is utilized. And uh, the tubular bale really kind of got me because it's something that I would do in my own work. So um, really, really an inspirational piece to me as well. So there's that. Um, thank you for sticking with uh, me. This one, let's see here. It's all jumbled up because again, didn't really go through. This one is a very large, usually they're not this big and usually um, they are less complex and the stones usually aren't as good. These are synthetic stones. You can tell by the color saturation, at least I can tell by the color saturation, no color zoning in the stones. So, um, but beautiful bezel set. The, cru the, uh, the cross is from Jerusalem and you can tell these just by the way they're created customarily they're signed on the back either sterling or 800 silver i don't see a hallmark on this one but i guarantee this to be sterling or 800 silver and then kind of this etruscan granulation so these tiny little beads are called granulation and then um, the wire work is sometimes um, referred to as um I believe it's, uh, some people will call it chant, uh, chantilly, or I, I'm drawing a blank on the term. Here I go again, stumbling over a word. Um, but regardless, just a great construction and an oxidation um, put down in. So it does give great depth to this. And if this was all one tone, it wouldn't look quite so beautiful on a nice um, sterling rope chain. So that was one thing that, again, loved it, loved it, loved it. And then this one was an, an absolute yes as soon as I saw it. It didn't take me long. Let me flip that over. What's going on here? <laughs> it's tangled. Um, so there is this. And let me wipe. God, this is quite the dirty mess. Um, so it came with this information right here. And this is from a jeweler. So it says 14 karat white gold. It says 0.32 karat tanzanite. There's no way, no way that that's 0.32. It's at least a full carat, at least, I, I guaranteed full carat. And then the 0.18 carat weight in diamonds and then the weight of the gold. Um, I won't show you what I paid for because it was an absolute steal and I am going to sell it. The color play inside the tanzanite is quite remarkable. So you have the blue and the purple that, they, that people that buy look for. And then the quality of the diamonds, just really, really, really clean, beautiful um, pave set stones, very, very small. And then the back is just well done on a beautiful white gold chain. It's it, it's just, I, I knew that someone would go absolutely crazy for this, and I knew that I could sell it very well. And I guess I should compare that stone. Um, I don't have, let me see if I have something on my desk to compare the stone. Um, I, I, I don't, but um, in, in this brooch, the central diamond uh, is um, just at a carat. So you can see that that tanzanite is not 32 points. It's much, much larger. Uh, and I mean much, much larger. So um, there's, you know, at least a carat there. So uh, that was a good buy. Let me back this out. I feel like I'm getting distracted, but I am I promised you this video. So here I am. Um, and I'm so proud to be with you. Um, there is this. It is Native American constructed. Again, someone immediately would say, well, the stone is cracked. 
so many times um, the stones in Native American jewelry do have fissures or cracks. It happens. It happens when you set the stones or it happens when you wear them. I have this great tendency to have such forgiveness. It's a natural part of the stone. I just don't care. <laughs> it's just me. I just don't care. Beautifully hand-constructed mounting, and the chain is just remarkable. Again, it was an absolute yes. You know, I walked up, I saw it, and absolutely fell in love. It was from my friend Steve. I got a, a discount on it. I didn't even need the discount because, again, it was definitely coming home with me, 100%. Um, and there's something timeless about these pieces that um, they have such a power and such um, positivity and spread that to not only the wearer, but the people that are viewing the piece. So that's beautiful. And I believe that's Navajo. Um, I, I, I could be wrong, but probably not. Um, I'll get into, as I fumble through this box that's like seemingly 20 feet away from me, <laughs> um, arrowheads. Uh, again, I'll, I'll do a whole other video on arrowheads, but these are all authentic. Um, I believe that most of them are from Indiana. Um, the gentleman that I spoke with, uh, the collection was from the border of Indiana and Ohio. Um, form and stone doesn't look native Ohio to me on a few of them, but the way they're worked and the way they're handled, um, just really got me. Um, really got me. And, uh, so thin and so beautiful in really good condition. Not perfect condition, but in really good condition. This one was just, to me, the form of this one. Sometimes, you know, form and material really speaks to me as a collector. And uh, this, just remarkable that this survived coming out of the ground. So thin, so well crafted. Uh, and the stone, look at the stone. It looks like a river flowing through the stone. And um, I'm 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 um, an an odd collector with arrowheads because I look at not only form and material, um, but I I look at um, the artistry that the person had that was creating these because they were only used to stay alive really or ceremonial sometimes. But um, I believe this is a Stillwell blade, and uh, again, uh, it may have been a Thebes that was altered because the way this is notched out here, maybe this was redone, So, and maybe this was made shorter over time, so maybe it was a Thebes that was altered. Not 100% sure. So uh, before I start saying what things are, I always do my research, but the deposits on here definitely say I am very, very old. I am, in fact, likely ancient. Um, and that one's just uh, remarkable. Age on these, I would say they probably range from, you know, maybe 8,000 years old to maybe 2,000 years old. Again, the experts um, that know more than me, um, I will consult and I will figure things out and figure out forms and also the types of stone that were used. Um, a brooch that Again, one of the first things that I bought because it was an emotional buy and I just couldn't leave her, this ghostly, ghostly portrait of a beautiful woman, just, an, again, an artist that had a remarkable day of creating in a sterling silver bezel and then a border that is just these half round or applied tubing, lots of wear on these, so you've seen it's been around for a long time. And then so faintly hallmarked right there, Sleeping Girl, 1978, R. Susan Mitchell. I don't know R. Susan Mitchell, and I barely could see that in the light of the show because it was so dark, and I just knew. I knew she was coming home and, again, haven't cleaned or haven't really gone over this for any other information, but I promised a fancy show and tell, so here we are again. So um, just a haunting portrait, just something um, that you normally don't see. So something I wanted to go after. Uh, oh, let's do um, these three. So I'll put that on and then just some sterling silver pendants with gemstones. 
Again, well-crafted, really well-crafted, new and contemporary, but an easy sell for me. Put a sterling chain on them and um, make some money to go out and buy some more things. And then this. Uh, this was at a pawn shop, $299.95. I did get a very large discount on it. So we have Lapis, Malachite, Mother of Pearl. I'm not sure on the redstone just yet. This is stabilized turquoise, and that is some sort of, I would suspect that's still Lapis on that side. Um, beautiful craft. So as I looked at it, it looked familiar to me. And as I looked on the inside, and you know pawn shops don't research the hallmarks. They just buy it for the gold value. Let me try and get in on that a little bit more. See if I can get you in on the hallmark. I don't know why my phone... There we go. Bingo. I'm not going to move. Okay, there you go. So it says 14K-A-S-H. So that is Osh Grossbart. And they were a producer that unfortunately, I believe they went out of business maybe 10 or 15 years ago, but they did incredible, incredible inlay work. And I believe that they almost always worked in gold. They may have worked in sterling, but again, this ring retail when it was made was probably around $1,800. Um, so I knew that there was money to be made. And um, I, I just feel like pawn shops can sometimes really be an excellent place to buy at. And then, where did I put that other thing? Uh-oh, I just kind of misplaced one, the thing I was going to talk about with that. Um, oh, this cuff and this pendant and my fire agate, because someone asked had, someone had asked about this. And um, fire agate right there, it's just windowed, meaning they put a little window on the stone so that they could see what the stone had to offer. And um, really great colors on this. Purple, lime green, a little bit of blue, a little bit of orange. Um, really, really a heck of a stone. Um, so usually what a, a lapidary artist will do is they'll cut all of this kind of mother stone away. They'll cut all of that out and then they'll just set this. Me as an artist, why wouldn't you leave all that there? I, that to me is just as beautiful as the color play on the inside. So you know I'm 99% I'm sure, um, unlike everybody else, I am going to leave that rind, if you will, on the outside. And I'm going to work that into my design. Um, just really, really beautifully done. And look at fire agate that isn't finished. You would just walk past that if that was on the ground. You probably wouldn't pick it up. But then you start cutting through the layers and boom, that is a hell of a beautiful thing. And Mother Nature had an exquisite day that day. Not the finest fire agate I've ever seen, but for $20, I was so quick to get that money out, I almost ripped a hole in my pocket. <laughs> so this is um, sterling and turquoise. Again, a beautiful cuff, really just just classy. Um, uh, again, um, you know, not something that was, you know, earth shattering, but definitely something that had to be bought. I believe it was 10 or $12. And the craft on that, really, really, really stunning. Very, very wearable. And then this pendant, Again, I'm still going to do research on this stone. I thought I knew what it was. And before I make a blunder and make a fool of myself, I'm not going to do it. And it was $30. I believe that I got it for, I think, I got it for $20. And when you buy in bulk, um, you, you obviously get discounts. And uh, I, I don't really ever think about the discounts. I just buy. Not sure on the hallmark here. Uh, definitely Maker's Mark. Um, beautiful and thick. Look at the thickness of the bale. Sure sign of quality. And the bezel, really remarkable craft. Very, very well done bezel. So be very, very um, considerate of what the craft is on the piece. And again, I'm going to go with it's in the agate or jasper family, but I'm going to hold on because I, I don't want hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> and then there is this. Uh, I have to wipe this one off. And again, I could talk about this for quite a little while. Um, it's a genuine citrine. Uh, at first, I thought it was glass because it was too even colored and the color seemed off for me. But then I started seeing the color play inside the stone. When I flipped it upside down, and uh, this is kind of a layman's term, and I'm sure, you know, um, gemological people are probably going to come for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, let me lay it down. Okay, so I'm going to try and zoom in. Here we go. 
and now you can see all the dirt in the box from all the stuff I haven't cleaned yet. See the color zoning in the stone? See how this is, there's like a color band of darker yellow and then it's lighter yellow? So that's genuine citrine. Um, in colored stones, you gotta be careful because some of the, um, shall you say, flux inclusion grown or some of the man-made stones, uh, they will have color zoning, but that's more in terms of like emerald, sapphire, ruby. So uh, I'll get into that later. I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go crazy about um, certain information as of right now. But um, I'm gonna zoom back in. This is just incredible. It is just absolutely incredible. Look at the detail work on the mounting. The way they push and pulled the metal after they cast it putting that oxidation in, and then look, they didn't have to, but they went right down inside that poppy flower. I'm zooming in again, here we go. Um, look at the detail work inside of that flower. What is going on? That artist did not need to get down in there and put that kind of detail, like the stamen and the pistols, they didn't need to get down in there. They just didn't need to do it. And then look at the detail on that. I mean, what in the world? Look how detailed, and look at the finish that they put on it. Just one of those things that, again, as soon as I saw it, instantaneous buy. It was an absolute yes. And the stone, the shape of the stone, the, just the whole construction. Signed on the inside, very, very faintly, right there. Really hard to read. Then on this other sign, proudly marked 14 karat. And just beyond that, dated, uh, it's 1967. So it's got a date line, uh, a date mark on the inside line of the ring. The shank system, beautifully hammered, beautifully finished. And again, that was just a 100% yes. So I hope you love that just as much as I did. I'm going to try and get this video done in just a couple more minutes. So thank you for sticking with me. Um, these, I didn't quite go through this yet. Let me back back out a little bit. I'm a little too close. Again, these were just buys that I knew would be things that I could sell. And um, so here is an amethyst necklace that was artist and created again signed on the bottom i almost missed the signature kh not really sure who kh is but boy oh boy he or she had a heck of a good day creating a bezel for a beautiful amethyst stone hand constructed chain really loved that and then we had let me scoot this this is a marcasite brooch and it's a very old one so we see marcasites that aren't old and I don't want to say yawn boring <laughs> because it sounds like a designer, but I say yawn like totally bored and boring usually for marcasite for me, but this one, not so much. Elegant, large marcasites, again, all bead set. Now, when you see contemporary marcasite, they're just haphazardly glued in and you wonder why you're losing half of them. Look for the old ones. Don't fall prey to the new ones. Just don't do it. Um, it's not worth it. And then we have the old, old, old turn of the century, just after the turn of the century, fold over clasp, and then signed right down in there, and I believe it says Germany and Sterling. So again, undersized, uh, smaller than normal, but look at the life. Look at the dazzle, just pure elegance in terms of design. Really, really, really loved it. And then to focus again, um, of course, Labradorite, it always sells. But, you know, again, just a, just a gemstone, but that one was just too pretty to pass up. I believe that was uh, 10 or $15. Again, you can get these things. You just got to get out and look. Um, Dichroic glass set in sterling silver. It was 25 I got it for 20 Loved, loved, loved the craft. And I love the bezel. And guess what? I really enjoyed the stone and the patterning in the stone. So that got me going. Um, a bead I really didn't much care about. Diamond stud earrings and sterling silver. These were like $5, but I always have luck with these because they look so beautiful. Good craft on those. These, I'm not really sure what was going on, and I don't know where the other one is at. I don't know where it's at. But um, of course, I'm believing that they are possibly natural stones because there is a little bit of variance in the blue and then definitely CZ or uh, white zircon uh, in the clear, but just great craft and uh, beautifully constructed. So I loved those. And then this cuff, um, again, tribal, fantastic, just, just a remarkable piece. Signed on the inside, it's $40. I think I paid, maybe I paid um, 30 
And then you can see where someone acid tested it. I did not do that. I would never do that. Um, no one should ever do that uh, to anything. But that was acid tested and it ate some of the, um, you know, finish away. Um, unfortunate to see that. Um, but at least they didn't gouge the metal and saw into it and test it that way, which I've seen so many times. Um, it, that's not necessary. And I'll get into how you can tell what kind of uh, materials you have. Um, one of the last things in jewelry that I'll talk about before I let you all go and enjoy your Sunday, these diamond line earrings, these diamond studs at the top, and then let me settle these down. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I don't know why I always fight with things on camera because normally I don't. And um, I'll just kind of line this one up. I know it's going to happen. I'm going to fuss with it, and then it's going to flip over. All right. So um, beautiful, uh, beautiful European cut diamonds. Um, really good uh, quality in terms of clarity. They do lean a little yellow, but I'll get into antique diamonds eventually. Um, antique diamonds had a tendency um, to be coming out of mines in Africa. And um, the mines didn't really produce that white of diamonds for the most part, unless you got into the gold. Uh, um, Golconda mines, which produced um, some of the whitest diamonds that were ever found anywhere in the world. Um, and Golconda diamonds are something that I will talk about because I do have two of them in my collection. Um, and then these are European cut, so they're um, very deep and very beautiful. And then a line design. Interesting that someone at some point had put contemporary corkscrew earring backs on to then hold them in place better. These mountings are definitely antique. This is considered um, a knife edge, even though it's really not knife edge, it's considered a knife edge bar. Normally a knife edge comes more to a point, so this is just kind of a bar design, and then jump ring soldered on. And again, these stones are just really, really, really beautiful. Look at the scintillation in old diamonds. Um, you go to contemporary jewelry stores, and you just don't see that quality in terms of the cutting. They perform, antique diamonds perform in lower light. Uh, so they will push and pull the light and really give you some positive feedback. <laughs> Who doesn't like positive feedback? All right. Um, one final thing. Um, and then, oh, 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 no. Two final things. So um, this bag that, um, this, that Sandy designed for um, her, um, her customers to have their items packaged appropriately. Sorry, I zoomed out so far. Probably saw the mess on my floor and uh, probably saw the mess in my box. But um, this is the Scotty Dog bracelet. And again, I in I think of the known collections, um, I probably have the 10th largest in the United States. And maybe it's in a, a little bit more of a, a, a prominent place now, but it, it's not a competition. But I do have a gigantic collection of wooden pins and wooden bracelets and, of course, necklaces. Uh, but this Scotty Dog clamper really got me really remarkably done. He's got such a great personality. His eyes are glass eyes inset, and his little leather collar is still there, but just a remarkable clamper bracelet that it was a have to have. It, it was an absolute yes for this guy. And then the only other thing that I wanted to discuss, even though there's way more stuff on my desk, was the vase that everyone seemed to go crazy for. Again, look at the coloration of this and, and look at the craft, um, the tonality and the um, beautiful multiple coloration in the red and the orange. Um, I, I, was, um, I was really taken aback by this. Um, the craft, the design, again, I said that I love the way the color was, but I also like the way the forms fit onto this. I loved the shape of the vessel. Um, again, signed, um, inscribed, and dated on the bottom. So we've got a signature, we've got two Betty, and we've got the date. Let's tip it right there. I believe it's 1978. Uh, I believe, but just really one of those incredibly special things. Um, and as an artist, I um, just responded to this so, so drastically. So thank you again for letting me do these videos. And thank you again for tuning in. Please, I ask you, go to my other tabs. Please look at my short feeds. Please look at my community tab. I just posted a, um, a, um, a video that I borrowed from YouTube on Joey Benage. As you know, I don't have a tendency to share things that are already on YouTube or already online, um, just because I want to teach you from my experience um, and what I do personally and share my personal journey. But Joey Benage, um, I really would love for you to go over and take a look at that video. I'm a remarkable artist and someone that the world uh, should truly miss. 
I never met Joey, but I feel like uh, through owning one of his masterworks, I feel like I definitely knew him and um, a beautiful soul and uh, a beautiful message in that video. Also, um, I ask you to please continue to like and if you would, if you don't mind, please share me out to somebody else who you think would enjoy my content. Again, thank you all so much. You know I end it with I love you, but I so appreciate each and every one of you. Do not forget that. I love you very much.